teacher and author William Willimon wrote a little Christmas greeting to King Herod this year. It's short and sweet. Troubled Christmas to you, Herod, it says. Thanks for reminding us, without intending to do so, that the babe at Bethlehem is not only gift, joy, but also threat. That's a note with some bite to it, huh? Makes my usual Christmas card sound pretty tame. But Matthew's version of the Christmas story is not tame. Today's reading is a harsh and jarring reminder of that fact. This all started because of a star, you know. A star shone brightly over Bethlehem a couple thousand years ago, and the way Matthew tells it, there were people watching the sky somewhere far off to the east. In Luke's familiar telling, it is shepherds who first received the Christmas message. Unlikely characters, because shepherds weren't exactly the first people you would imagine to be recipients of earth-shaking news. Simple folk out in the fields with not the best reputation for clean and honest living. But if anything, the first recipients of the Christmas message in Matthew are even less expected, even stranger. They're people who come from some unnamed distant land, who speak some language other than Hebrew, and who practice astrology, which is something the Bible doesn't exactly have a lot nice to say about. These foreigners, with their strange religion and dress and language, follow the star and show up unannounced at Herod's place. And things get awkward pretty quickly. Because as Fred Craddock says, you don't go asking the king, where's the king? Herod's expectations are immediately raised. Matthew's telling of the Christmas story doesn't have any angels singing glory to God in the highest and peace on earth. Instead, Matthew has the birth of a child whose cries immediately send ripples out through the world, drawing unexpected visitors and setting the powerful on the defensive. I'm guessing most of us maybe like the sound of that this Christmas. I personally like the sound of God's presence, manifest in a baby, no less, frightening the tyrants around us this year. Lord knows there are plenty who are lording power over others with fear and deception and division, paranoid ones who can't abide a higher loyalty than themselves. I like the sound of Christmas striking fear into the hearts of tyrants, and I like the idea of it reminding Christmas that the event of Jesus' birth actually makes a great claim on us. That if we name this baby in Bethlehem as our king, then no one else truly rules in our lives. Not Herod, not money, not the approval of others, not the fear of politicians or presidents or people who are different from us. This baby claims us and reorients our lives and sets us on a new path. It sounds crazy, but it's exactly what we mean to say at Christmas. The tyrants of the world don't like the sound of that much, and they shouldn't. So troubled Christmas to you, Herods of the world, I'm glad to say this year. May the baby born in Bethlehem leave you shaking in your boots. I like the sound of all that. But what about when the Herods of the world strike back? Because that's where our story brings us today. The wise men from the east left Herod in Jerusalem, promising to come back when they had found this baby who would be king. And sometime later, Herod realized that he'd been duped. He realized that these stargazing out-of-towners with the funny accents were not coming back to tell him anything. And so he lashed out in the way a tyrant will, using violence to ensure his power won't be threatened. Unnamed, uncounted children in Bethlehem pay the price. It is a horrible story. This is up there with the worst that the Bible has to offer. I wish there were something else to talk about after the birth of the baby Jesus. I wish Matthew gave us sweet stories of his first words or his first toddling steps, or even stories of him as a teenager with an attitude testing the limits of his parents. We do say he was fully human, after all. But Matthew has none of that. Jesus is born. The world shakes, and the next thing you know, he is 30 years old and being baptized by John. I wish there were something else, but this is what we have, and that must be to tell us something. 
Biblical scholars will tell you that in recounting the story this way, Matthew is making a not-so-subtle connection between Jesus' life and the larger story of Scripture, showing that from the very start his story is wrapped up in the story of the Hebrew people. Because you remember they have a little bit of a history with Egypt, right? The people of Israel once lived in Egypt and were led out into freedom. The infant Jesus is making something of that same journey here, into Egypt and out again. And you remember that the people have a bit of a history with tyrants too, right? Centuries ago in Egypt, when the people of Israel were growing in numbers, there was another nervous king around, another ruler desperate to preserve his power, who would roll right over children to keep it, who would order all the baby boys born to the Hebrew people to be thrown into the Nile. It was under the rule of that murderous pharaoh that Moses was born, the one who would lead the people to freedom. Jesus then, the liberator, is born into a similar situation, into a dangerous world with rulers who are just as vile, just as prone to violence and disregard for human life. So that's probably part of what Matthew is up to, telling us about Jesus' birth in this way, showing us that the story mirrors and extends the story of the Bible. But that can't be all. It also shows us that from the very beginning, from before he can even speak or walk, Jesus is in solidarity with those who suffer. He's carried close to his mother's body on a fearful, unplanned run through the desert, where his nervous parents try to avoid the gaze of soldiers along the way. And so he's in solidarity with everyone making fearful journeys today, with Eritreans facing persecution in their home country, and with children in violent neighborhoods in Chicago who need to walk along special safe routes to get to school each day, routes that are lined with workers in neon vests making sure they make it from one place to the next. Jesus spends his first years seeking shelter in a foreign land among people with a different language and culture and religion. And so he's in solidarity with refugees everywhere today, with people struggling to make a life in a land that's not their own in an unfamiliar place without the comforts and securities of family and home. Jesus returns to his home to find that danger remains in the form of Herod's son, who has the reputation for being every bit as violent as his father. And so he is in solidarity with all those who live in uncertainty and in fear today. I think of Iraqi Christians from around the area near Mosul who have been allowed to return to their homes this Christmas but who worry about the continued instability of their situation, who wonder if their community will ever live in peace and security again. Jesus' beginnings point where his whole life will lead, toward his presence and his solidarity with those who suffer. This doesn't answer all the questions, of course. Why did baby Jesus make it out of Bethlehem and not all the other children born around the same time? Why aren't there more dreams like Joseph that guide people out of danger and into safety? Why are tyrants allowed to rage and reign at such horrible cost? The story doesn't give answers to those questions, and I don't trust any easy ones some theologian might have to offer. But I can tell you things I do trust today. Lament and resistance. We're going to pray a prayer of lament together in a few moments. And please understand, this is not a time for enforced communal wallowing. Lament is one of the many languages of prayer that the Bible gives us. It's prayer that's honest and searching and calling out to God when we don't know exactly what else to say. It helps us let out our confusion and our frustration so those things don't just stay inside and poison us. I think the reading today leads us there. I trust that kind of honesty, and I also trust resistance to the tyrant's ways of violence and fear. I think that's one reason that we lament, so that we can speak our questions and speak our anger and continue resisting with all that we have. You can start your resistance this new year right here at the communion table this morning, where we proclaim and where we act out a different way of life, where all are gathered in, where all are fed, where there is enough to go around, where fear is banished, 
and where we are reminded of the deep truth that we are part of one body, that we belong together. Jesus is born into a messy, dangerous world, a world where Herods do abound and wield great power and don't take kindly to people challenging it. This story reminds us that Jesus enters into that world and into our world too. Here at the edge of a new year, in this world full of beauty and fear, loveliness and danger, we remember that Jesus continues to come with his reign of justice and peace. And when the Herods lash out and when they push back, we know that Jesus is there in the thick of it, beside those who suffer, in solidarity with them, calling us to follow, calling us to resist. This is what we should expect from Jesus, after all, the one whose name is the great promise, with us this day and to the end of the age, Emmanuel, God with us. Amen.